to share. I, I told Nancy, I, I, she just impressed the socks off of me a few minutes ago when we were closing out singing Agnes Day, and I'm over here to the side, and I've got my hands raised, and I look over, and she's down on her knees with one hand raised to God, one hand still playing the keyboard while she's got her head bowed. I was like, that's talent. I don't care who you are. And never missed a note. I can put my hands on the keyboard all day long. That don't mean I'm going to do anything with it. So, um, as Will just mentioned a minute ago, today is in fact Pentecost Sunday. It, it's staggering to think that almost you know, some 2,000 years ago, that God poured His Spirit out upon all flesh. That the 120s we read of in Acts chapter 2, that were Acts 1 and chapter 2, that were in the upper room waiting for God. They didn't know what they were getting exactly, but they knew the promise of God was coming. And almost 2,000 years ago, it hit. And when he hit, and the power of God hit man, the ecclesia, the, the, the church, the body of Christ was birthed. And as I said to you guys just a few weeks ago, the reason that we assemble together, according to Acts 2 and 42, is that we come together for the teaching of the gospel message, the word of God being taught, that we come together for the observing of communion as we did this morning. We come together for the fellowship of the saints, and it says we come together for corporate prayer. That's what we do when we assemble. Those, those are the reasons. That's the fundamental reasons why we come together. And if you read in Matthew in chapter 16, you read of the account where Jesus has the disciples aside. Um, this is Sarah Philippi, and he's talking to him, and he says, you know, so who do men say that I am? And it says they all answered. It says they answered. And he started getting a barrage of answers. Well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're another prophet. And then he pops the next question. Well, who do you say that I am? Out of their own mouths, he had just seen by their confession that mankind in our natural state, our natural mind, will not understand who he is. That the people rejected him. They didn't know who or what he was. And they just admitted that. So then he, he, he pops the big question, well, who do you say that I am? And it doesn't say they answered. Only one answer came. Simon Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You are Peter, Petros, little rock. And upon this rock, Petra, Christ being the foundation rock, the big rock, Upon this rock, the foundational truth that you have revealed, that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, I will build my church on that foundation, and the gates of hell shall never prevail against it. Do you understand that because when the church started some 2,000 years ago on Pentecost Sunday, and we were built upon the foundational truth that Jesus is the Christ, and God filled us with his Spirit, that hell, and that is the reference to death itself, would never, ever, ever, ever again have a grip upon his saints, that his children would never be fearful or bound by death. It would have no more claim on us. We are immune, exempt to death. We will never die. And because of the power of the Spirit of God living inside of you, you are above the standards of this world. You are not bound to nor subject to the God of this world or His demons. The principalities and powers cannot stop you. They cannot interfere with your business. If they get in your way, the Bible says you'll stomp on them like serpents and scorpions. You are unstoppable. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we ain't even in the sermon yet. You know, I, I thought about this this morning. Back in 1998, I was sitting in Nayland Stadium, the greatest football stadium in the world. It was homecoming game of 1998. Tennessee had just beaten UAB. And everybody's getting ready to leave the stadium. And the announcer comes on and announces over the PA system that I don't know if it was Michigan, Michigan State. Somebody had just lost that night. And because of their loss, it pushed Tennessee up and tied for number one in the country in 1998. And I mean, not just the stadium, but the whole city erupted into a raucous roaring and screaming and cheering and yelling because the football team moved into the number one slot. When I say to the body of Christ that we have been filled with the Spirit of God, that we are unstoppable, we are seated in the heavenlies with the King of kings and Lord of lords, I mean you ought to blow up, blow your top, run the room, run outside screaming. 
If we get excited over a pigskin being thrown across the field, then how much more for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords? Hallelujah. At least some Pentecostalism in this place. I was raised Southern Baptist. We were quiet. It didn't matter what the preacher said. You may get a... And that was it. And then I moved into these crazy Pentecostal people. Man, it went nuts. I found out then I could use these things for something else besides sticking them in my pocket, you know? If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew? We're going to go to chapter 5 because we're still in our study from Matthew in chapter 5. Um, last week, I mentioned to you how that Yeshua had said in the Sermon on the Mount, we're still in that series. We're not going to be coming off on any time soon because we're still in chapter 5. We've still got two more chapters to go. And this is the 15th lesson in on it, if that gives you any idea. But I mentioned last week that Jesus had stressed to the disciples, he said, do not think that I've come to lessen or abolish the laws and the prophets. I have come rather to fulfill the laws and the prophets. And he said, I'm going to fulfill every minuscule detail of the law, from the smallest letter in the Hebrew writing to the smallest stroke of the pen. If it's in the law, it will be fulfilled in and by and through me. And in stressing that he was going to go to such great lengths to do something that no other person could do, he was showing to his disciples, both then and now, that it would require something of us as his followers. That we would have to do the seemingly impossible with regards to how we interact with the world around us and the people that we come in contact with, especially when it comes to the subject of conflict. He was saying, because I'm going to show you by me fulfilling the law, I'm going to show you the true intent of my father's law. You've only seen it from the legal side because that's all you ever had it presented to you as was a legal thing. The works and the fulfillment of the law through the legal aspect. I'm going to show you the full meaning of why my father put his law into place and it's going to require something of you if you truly claim to be mine. And then I mentioned that last week I started this. I said that after he said this about fulfilling the law, he gave six examples about how the law had been misunderstood, misquoted, misused, changed even, to fulfill the evil and wicked hearts of mankind, but how we had missed the deeper meanings of the law. And we looked at two of those last week. We looked at the area of lust and the area of anger. You remember Jesus said that it, you have read or you have heard that it was said that you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that if you even lust for another person in your heart, you've already committed the act of adultery. That's the deeper meaning of the law. He said, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit murder, but I say that if you have anger in your heart or you speak out against a brother in anger, if you have hatred and unforgiveness in your heart, you're just as guilty as the person that committed the act of murder. What Jesus was saying was, I don't care how it manifests physically. I'm saying to you, if it's inside of your heart and you're holding it there and you're pondering it and you're meditating it, you're just as guilty as the one that does it. And that's a very damning statement. You're just as guilty. When you look on the news and you see where they've got people that have been arrested and they're, you see their mug shots and they have that glare looking, oh, they look evil, they deserve whatever they get. Hypocrite. Don't forget you've held malice and anger and bitterness in your heart for somebody else at some time also and you're just as guilty. That's the point of the Christ. It does not matter how and when it manifests physically. It's the fact that it's in there. That's what's sick in God's heart. You come into my house, God would say, and raise your hands and worship me, yet you hold things in your heart that I say are contrary to my word, my laws, my commands, my will. That's why Jesus said, don't even fool with going into the sanctuary and bringing your offerings before God. If it's in your heart, go to the person, make it right, get right with God, and then come back and offer it. Then God will accept it. Hallelujah. Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, you know there's two sermons that we talk about. There's the Sermon on the Mount that we're talking about in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. But in Luke, Luke's Gospel in chapter 6, verses 17 through 49, there's what we call the Sermon on the Plain. And he expounds in certain ways of, of things that he didn't say in Matthew's uh, teaching. And in other areas, he shortens it. But it's, it's, a, it's another teaching. But in Luke 6, 45, Yeshua says, The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of the evil treasures produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
you can fool me and everybody around you, is what Jesus was saying to him back then. But eventually, what's in your heart is going to manifest. It will eventually show itself. What's that old saying? You can fool some of the people some of the time, however that goes. In Matthew 7, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said it this way, So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown to the fire. Thus you will recognize a person by their fruits. I've been called a fruit many times before in my life. I don't know if it was good or bad, but... Who and what we truly are inside of our hearts will manifest, and it will be made known to others, good or bad. But God always sees what's inside of our hearts. You cannot hide it from the Father. And the same thing applies to our anger towards others, uh, how you hold that towards people. It's easy. That's why I picked those two last week, or that I think the Spirit of God asked me to pull those two forward first, is because lust and anger, many people, many, many people deal with in their hearts. And it's those secret sins. Nobody knows what I think about them. I can look at you and smile. I can look at Chip Wood over here and smile and say, I love you, dude. But in my heart, I'm thinking, I can't stand you, Chip. Fall off the road and die tomorrow. Not really. I don't want you. Because you, he can't see that. But God sees everything. I'm not fooling the Father. And one day, if I hold this in me, regardless of how righteous, how pious I act before others, one day I will stand before a righteous God and he will say, as he reads before me in the eternities of heaven, this is what was in your heart. You held this against your brother that whole time. Now you will give an account for it and now you will answer for it. Well, God, it was just a thought. No, it was the truth of your heart. And I told you, you serve me with your heart. You cannot serve me and serve the world. So last week, lust and anger. Today we're going to move forward. We're going to talk about another one, maybe two of the examples that he gave. I'm not going to talk about two of them really at all. Um, I just don't feel led to. I'm not really going to talk about divorce, and I'm not really going to talk about taking oaths. You can read those for yourself. The understanding is the same in both of those situations about how that God looks at divorce, how that God looks at oaths that you take or promises that you make. It's a condition of your heart. Everything that we do in the kingdom of God is based upon the true condition of our heart. But if you're in Matthew's gospel in chapter 5, I'm going to go ahead and move to uh, verses 38 through 42. That's where we'll start off reading this morning. Matthew 5, starting with verse 38. Yeshua says, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. Now, when Yeshua says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, he's quoting directly from the Old Testament. That was part of the old Levitical law. You can read examples of it. Exodus 21, 24, it says it. Uh, Leviticus 24, 20, it says it. Deuteronomy 19 says it. And when you read throughout those passages where it's mentioned, you'll read things like, if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. If anyone injures his neighbor, as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, and tooth for tooth. And when you read this, you may think to yourself, that's kind of harsh. How is that the heart of God? Well, in order to understand what the law is saying, you must understand what the law is not saying. The phrase eye for eye and a tooth for tooth went way, way, way back through the ages. In fact, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth goes further back than before Moses came on the scene. Way before the law was ever given, that was instituted and in place. There's a legal set of writings that are called the Code of Hammurabi, and it was written like back in the 18th century B.C., way, way back. And within this code, you find the phrase, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. Man had developed for themselves a sense of civil justice. Um, The understanding being, if there's a punishment, uh, if, if there's a crime, there has to be a punishment that fits the crime. But the punishment, this was both from man's civil system and what God put into place. God just took what man had in this instance and reapplied it because they, he, they already understood the law as it was given. 
God reinstated it for the kingdom, but with his emphasis as to how it deals with the heart. But the person that had been wronged was never the one that could give the punishment in both cases, both in the secular outside world and in the kingdom of God. It was never permissible that the person that had been wronged was the one that administered the punishment. In other words, you couldn't be the one that made up, well, they did this to me, so this is what I think should happen to them. If you go back and read in Deuteronomy 19, God says that if a brother has something against another brother, that he's accused him of something, both of them shall come and stand before the Lord first, always the Lord, the priest and the judges. There were appointed judges that weighed in with the priest. It was like a a courtroom scene, if you will. And God said, that's how it's going to be handled. And you will listen to both sides. The one will plead their case, the other will plead their case. If the brother that's making an accusation against the other brother is found out to be lying, then whatever he said he wanted done to the brother is what's going to be done to him. And if one has wronged the other and you find that it's wrong, then justice shall prevail. Whatever he did will be done to him. But it will be handled by a legal system and not just on man's whims. That was the idea behind an eye for an eye and a tooth. The punishment meets or matches the crime. And that that was understood even when Jesus himself walked the earth. There was a, a legal system in place. It was known as the law of retaliation. The Latin phrase would have been the Lex talionis. That's what it was in Latin. Law of retaliation. It was in place. It was a legal binding set of rules that even the Romans had in place. They all knew about the the lex talionis, the law of retaliation. And that's what it stated. The same understanding. Eye for eye, a a tooth for a tooth. But if you left it up to the individual, say like person A stole a donkey from person B, outside of a court system, Person B that had been wronged, if they were to make up the punishment, they'd say, well, they have to get me a new donkey, a better donkey, bigger and better, and then they need to be taken out, beaten within an inch of their life to teach them a lesson so they'll never want to do it again. And what would happen is the end result, the punishment would be way worse than the initial crime itself because man's heart, in and of ourselves, once we've been wronged, when we've been wounded, we want retribution. We desire retribution retaliation. From the time that we're small children, we desire it. You watch kids on the playground and one hurts another one. If one calls one a name, the other one will turn around and slug him, deck him, spit on him, throw it, get other kids to start laughing. You want them to pay for what they just did. And we don't outgrow it, we grow more into it. Our world, our society is built along the subject of retaliation. You can sue anybody for anything now in our system. I don't like the way you looked at me. I'm taking you to court tomorrow. I'm going to sue your whole family. That's why that God said the person who's been wronged is never allowed to issue the punishment. Because Yeshua, when he made this statement, just like his father, knows completely the heart of an individual. And he says, if your heart is bent towards getting even or gaining retaliation from someone, it is wrong, and I do not permit it. Even if it's legal. Yeshua wasn't, he wasn't limiting or uh, uh, lessening the retribution that a follower of his could legally seek against another person. No, he was forbidding retribution. Mankind has always understood that if somebody's wrong, just get even. You know, like... We love to watch a good, you know, action movie. I was thinking about this the other day. My, my wife and I went and saw the new Top Gun movie. <laughs> Reminds you of Tom Cruise, doesn't it? Yeah. We like a movie that has a lot of action, and we really love the movies when somebody gets even. We like to see the payback. We like it when some disheartened, dishonest, disloyal, bad guy does something wrong and the big studly macho guy shows up and literally just whips him all over the place and makes him a mocking, a laugh in front of everybody and we're like going, yes, yeah! That's what we want to see. How many action movies do you think would succeed if it was based from the Christian viewpoint? The guy comes in completely just belittles the guy because of his faith in Christ. Everybody's laughing and mocking at him. The big guy stands up and goes, I hope you know Christ one day. He can change you. And turns and walks out of the room. 
People be like, what? Hit him! Shoot him! Do something! Because we want to see retaliation. We crave it. We teach it in the churches, don't retaliate, but in our hearts, out in society, the things that we entertain ourselves, ourselves with, our attitude towards others. When somebody's in the gro uh, grocery store and they take the last box of cookies you're getting ready to get and they laugh as they pull them off the shelf and stare at you, you're thinking, I hope you choke on every one of them. Because <laughs> we want retaliation. And that's the problem that Jesus was saying. Let, let me let you know also... It is not forbidden. I want you to understand this. The Bible does not forbid us from defending ourselves. Um, he's not forbidding you and I from using our legal, civil legal system to protect ourselves and our families from wrong. God even put into place civil legal systems to protect his people from wrong and wrongdoing. Romans 13 is about that we abide by the laws as, as they're given in our system because God said they're there for your good, your protection. God is not saying that if somebody steals money from you, you can legally get it back if you go through the right steps. If somebody rams into your car when you leave here today because of our legal system, you can seek to have them fix it through justice. That We had the right to protect and defend ourselves. It was the great, late great Russian novelist Leo Tolstoy that said that when he read the gospel and he read the Sermon on the Mount, he says, I read it and I reread it and I reread it. And he had come to the conclusion that Christ was saying that nobody should be involved in anything that had to do with retaliation. You couldn't serve in the army. You couldn't serve in the police force. You couldn't be even in the courts of law. If it was any form of retaliation or resistance or force, it was forbidden is what he was saying by Christ. He said the words of Christ are irrefutable and you can't go against it. You're forbidden to do this. And there was an example of how something like his mindset had influenced another person. This story that a man was present when his daughter and his son-in-law were attacked physically by some thugs over a legal dispute. And they, they beat his wife and his son-in-law within an inch of life, just beat the trash out of him while he stood there and watched because he thought it was wrong to intervene. Because he had read that we are not to do that. That's not what Yeshua was saying. You and I have a system that protects us, that guards us, that gives us rights that we can abide by and under, that gives us the ability to protect what is ours. The Bible says as long as it's possible to live with peace with all men. Is that not what Paul says in Romans 12? But then the Bible also commands us to defend ourselves. That it's not wrong to defend yourself. Exodus 22.2, if the thief is caught while breaking in and struck so that he dies, there will be no blood guiltiness of his account. We're also told that we are to defend others. You don't sit back stoically and watch them get pillaged and plundered. Isaiah 117, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. You have a right to defend what is yours. That's not what Jesus was saying. I can tell you now. If tonight, late at night, somebody breaks in my house, I'm not going to stop and say, can we have a cup of coffee and discuss your intentions as to why you're in my home? I think we already know your intentions by virtue of the fact that you gained illegal access into my home. And because I've been given a legal system that allows me to do so, I'm going to let my representatives speak to you. Mr. Smith and Mr. Wesson are going to talk to you on my behalf. I'm not going to do any talking. I am legally protected, or I'm legally called by God as a husband and a father to protect my wife, my children, and my grandchildren, that which has been entrusted to me. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? This is not what Christ was forbidding us to do. Okay. Any questions after that, come see me afterwards. Yeshua was not saying your legal rights are revoked. What he was talking about, what he was saying that he forbids, is seeking personal retaliation, retribution, when somebody or somebody comes against us in order to slander us, to insult us, to make legal... Uh, legal what to do against us to hurt us in some way because of who we are as a servant in his kingdom. If I go out here today and three guys jump me because they're on drugs or because they just don't, they're having a bad day and they want to beat the trash out on me, Christ is not saying just lay there and get the trash kicked out of you because they want to do it. That's not what he's saying. Yes. A amen. But what he is saying 
and this goes all the way back to the Beatitudes about suffering for his namesake, that if you are truly doing the will of the Father and living for Christ and serving the kingdom of God, there's going to be times where you're going to incur the wrath of people, the mistreatment of people, the, the cruelty of people for his namesake. And he says, you will not retaliate against that. That's what Christ is saying in this, this example. You're forbidden to retaliate in that, that instance. He gave examples when he says that you're not to resist an evil person. Well, what does that look like? Well, he gave you examples of it. As soon as he says do not resist an evil person, he starts naming off examples. Whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. If you understand the culture and the time in which Jesus would have made this statement, it would make a little more sense to you. There was an offense. It was a, a strong offense... It was a horrible slander and insult that existed in his day and time. And the reason it says slaps you on the right cheek, the understanding is this. Most people are right-handed. It's always been that way. How many people are right-handed in this room right now? <laughs> Raise your hand. See, there's only a few of you guys that are out of your minds. The right people are right-handed. <laughs> See, I insult you. You can't say anything back to me. But the understanding is simple. How do you slap somebody with the right hand on the right side of the face? you have to openly backhand them. An open backhand to the right side of the face was a staunch, I mean, nasty insult. If somebody walks up to you and gives you a pop across the back of the face, that was as bad as the, probably the worst curse word that we could say to them. And you could actually seek legal ramifications for a public insult like that. It was so bad. So look what Jesus says. He's not talking about somebody walking up just cold cocking you. If they insult you, Rather than you come back and lash out against them, offer them a chance to do it again. You do not retaliate. For my name's sake, you will incur whatever they dish out. Because here's the understanding. God said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Paul says it in Romans 12. He talks about that you don't offer up evil for evil. You're never going to convert or change somebody's heart to the kingdom of God if you match their anger with your anger, if you match evil with evil, if you match vengeance with vengeance, wrath with wrath, whatever, you, however you want to say it. You will never convert and change a person. If they hit you and you hit them back, it increases. It fuels the fire that the enemy's wanting in place. The only way that you can diffuse it and show the love of Christ, which is what really changes a person, is if you offer them more of you in response to, like, if it's physical, that you don't retaliate and beat them back. If they try to, as Christ said, if they want to sue you, allow the suit to go forward. Whatever it takes to diffuse them, to show them the love of Christ, because your ultimate goal, as a matter of fact, our only goal is to lead somebody to Jesus. You cannot match wrong for wrong and show them the love of Christ. That's when he said, if they, if they take you to court, and they are going to sue you for your tunic, give them your cloak also. You have to understand what that means. And it goes all the way back in the Levitical law that God himself said that if somebody, because you owe them, has the right to... And clothing back then was, you know, it was, it was expensive and it was, you know, it was a must-have. And to live in that region, it could be harsh at times. And so they didn't have designer clothes stores and Walmarts in every place and Dollar General stores. You could just walk in and get a... I mean, it was very expensive and, and it was arduous to make clothing to get it. So you, you hung on to what you had. But if somebody was going because you owe them and they're going to take you to court and they're going to sue you for your tunic, your inner cloak, they could take that. But according to the law of God, they could not take your outer cloak. Even if they took it by law, they had to give it back to you by nighttime before the sun went down. Because the outer cloak was the blanket the means of warmth, it was the shelter from the heat, it was everything to a person back then. So God said, they can take the inner one, but they can't take the outer one, and if they do take it, you've got to give it back before sundown. So now look what Jesus says. If they take you to court, because they're going to try to hurt you in every way possible, and they sue you, and they get the inner cloak, the tunic, freely give them the outer one also. Blow their minds! They think they're going to rattle you and force you to do the enemy's work. I'm saying to do something that glorifies my Father. Go above and beyond what they think to show the love of the Father. Do 
Jesus says, if uh, you're asked to go a mile, there was a legal precedence back then. This came from the Persians, and it was adopted by the Romans. The Roman army was notorious when they're carrying their gear for war purposes. I'd, call, I'd say like, Gordon, you, buddy, get up here. You're carrying my stuff. And they had a legal precedence. We say a mile. It was a different unit of length, but we call it a mile for simple understanding. They could demand that you carry their armor, uh, weapons of war implementations, uh, whatever distance it was. Let's say it was a mile. They could make you carry it for them. They had the legal right to require you to carry it, and then they could find somebody else to make them carry it. You see something similar to it when Jesus is going to Calvary, and he couldn't carry the burden anymore, so what did the Romans do? They called Simon Serena and said, carry this. They had the right to require you to do it. So what does Jesus say? If they require you to go the distance, double it. Go more than what you've been asked, for my name's sake. If they're coming against you because they're trying to come against me, then go above and beyond because you'll heap coals of fire on their head. It will burn them with what you're doing. They won't understand it. The love of God always diffuses the work of the enemy. That's what you're called to do is diffuse the work of the enemy. You go back and read in 1 Samuel 25. I know that David was a man after God's own heart, but David was a hothead. David had an attitude problem. I'm not afraid to say it. David did. When God said to David, you cannot build me a temple because you have too much blood on your hands. It was the truth. David was zealous for it. You think I'm wrong? Go back and read 1 Samuel 25. David and his men been out hiding. They need food. They've been protecting the shepherds of this guy by the name of Nabal out in the fields for weeks. David says, it's time to call in a favor. So he goes down and he meets Nabal, has his servants go down and meet Nabal. And he says, hey... I know that it's, you know, harvest season, you're gathering right now, and you're bringing in the flocks and stuff. And he said, you know, we've been watching over your boys up in the field for weeks now. We've done them no harm. We've protected them. They never had to worry about anything while we were there. We could use some food. And the ball is like, I don't know who this David is, but you and this David better ride out of town. I have nothing to do with it. Everybody knew who David was. He was the anointed king. He just hadn't gotten to the place yet because Saul was after him, but everybody knew who David was. And the ball was being a horse's patoot. And he insulted David. The Bible says that David gathered 400 of his men and said, all right, that's fine. By this time tomorrow, I'll have every single servant of his slaughtered because he just insulted me. David had no legal right to go down and slaughter all those men because he was insulted. That wasn't a God-ordained, sanctioned move of God. There's nothing in the law that says if you're insulted, go slaughter the whole crew. I mean, there's not in there. David was going to clean house with a whole lot of them. And were it not for Nabal's wife, Abigail, that she interceded. Abigail, huh? <laughs> Abby, see? She interceded on behalf, and she made it right. And David relented and even said that he was glad that she had done it because it would have cost him a great thing before the eyes of God. He knew what he was doing was wrong, but he wanted retaliation because he was insulted. Jesus says, you do not have that right. I forbid you. I have seen Christians in the church over the years, even since Desiree and I have been married for 22 years, I have watched Christians come up to me and say, so-and-so was saying this about me. I'm taking them to court and I'm suing them for slander. I'll make them stop. I'll show them. Jesus says, you don't have that right. You don't. Our legal system has so much whacked out stuff in it. Like I said, you can sue something, somebody for anything now. And, of course, the attorneys will make it sound really good. They'll tell you all the reasons why you should be doing it. Mr. Palmer, you need to understand the defamation of character and what this is doing to you and your family and the burden it's going to place upon you and your children and your grandchildren. You should sue them now while we can do this. We can get, get this done at a reasonable cost. My fees, of course, up front, and then we'll get you settlement for this. You'll feel better off in the end. They'll make you think that's what you should do. And God's going... I told you to leave it alone. You don't... Take it even further. In uh, 1 Corinthians, I think it's... Uh, is it 1 Corinthians 6. I think when Paul's talking about the legality of... It's, it's almost a slap in the face, he said. I'm paraphrasing. When I see one believer taking another believer to court, he said, you should settle this stuff out of court as brothers and sisters in Christ because all you're doing is matching up what the world wants for your own lack of faith in God and your own desire, zealous desire for retaliation, he goes, it's wrong. 
It's wrong. But that's not what the world teaches us. And now you've got Christians that propagate that same message. Go after them, man. Man, slaughter them. They deserve it. They're going to do it to somebody else in the body if you don't stop them. And that's another discussion in and of itself, how you handle mistreatments in the body. We'll get to there another time. But we don't have the right to go after and seek retaliation, vengeance against somebody because we feel like they've come against us and they've, they've hurt our feelings. My dad used to say it this way, it's time to put on your big boy pants. Stop whining and crying and start being who you said you are. If you're a Christian, it's time to serve the Christ. Y'all start getting quiet now. I sell steel-toed boots back here if anybody needs some. Uh, and I'll let you get a set. If you feel like your toes are being stomped, stomped on right now, let me tell you something. Mine got crushed this week. I've been crushed by the words of the Father this week over things that I've done. My wife even called me up the other day. We were in the car driving somewhere. And somebody pulled out in front of me. I had to lock my brakes down and slow down real quick. I said, what a moron. She goes, moron? She said, Mr. Palmer, did you just not say last week that it's wrong to verbally? And I was like, Busted. Rather than seek retribution, you should seek the good of the person that's hurt you, the person that's offended you. Change them with the love of Christ. Retribution just fuels the anger. It fuels the bitterness. Only love and forgiveness, only the love and forgiveness of God can truly change the heart of another person. It's been said that forgiveness is the ultimate form of justice because it's the gift we most need in our pain yet we can only give it to ourselves when we are ready to yield it to those who have actually hurt us. As one writer called forgiveness the economy of the soul, because only forgiveness saves the expense of anger, the cost of hatred, and the waste of spirits. That is what we were called to do. And I'll close. I'm not going to spend much. I'm just going to mention what he said in the ending here of this section, Yeshua said, you have, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. You go all the way back to the beginning when Jesus was given the Beatitudes, those first things that we talked about at the beginning of Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's given the Beatitudes. The next to the last one before blessed are those who are persecuted is blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. That when people of this world come against you because of who you are in Christ, because of your faith and belief in Christ, and they come after you, he says, you're not supposed to be a peacekeeper. You're a peacemaker. You diffuse it by showing the love of Christ. And he says, you shall be called a son of God or a daughter of God. Pray for those who persecute you. He says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Interestingly enough, when you go down to, in the next chapter, in chapter 6, and I'm not going to spend much time talking about this, when he's talking about how we are to respond, what we are to look like as true servants of his, he mentions three different areas. He talks about that when you give to others, don't let other people know what you're doing. When you pray, don't let people see you praying in public. When you fast, don't let people know that you're fasting because it's, he says, let your Father who sees in the secret see you, and he will reward you. So when Jesus says, when you do as the rest of the world does, what reward do you have? Christ says, you've already got your reward. The recognition of man is all the reward you'll ever have. But he says, if you do everything that you do for the glory of my Father and you do it in secret where only he sees and knows what you're doing, but it's for his glory, he will reward you openly. You will receive a full reward for what you're doing. So which way do you want to have it? Do you want the recognition and the accolades of men that stops here and when you die you get nothing except recompense up there for all the, way, you know, all the things you've done wrong? Or do you want to serve in such a way as that people are, are shown the love of Christ, lives are changed here, doesn't matter if you get accolades or not, but when you get to heaven, you're going to hear him say, a job well done, my good and faithful servant, enter the joy of your master, and he rewards you for how you did. You get to pick. That's the glory of God. You get to pick which one you want. Praise God. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That's the hardest thing you'll ever learn. That's the hardest. When somebody comes to me and they're talking about things that are going on, the wrongs that people have done, and, and you ask that very simple question, well, how are you praying? Well, I'm praying, you know, that the Lord works me through this, and I'm praying that God gives me the strength to sustain while I'm going through this with them, and I'm praying that I get this, and I'm praying that I don't get that. Are you praying for the person? What do you mean am I praying for them? 
Are you praying for them? That's what you're called to do. Pray for the ones that persecute you. Pray for the ones that hate you. Everybody stand with me, please. If everybody was to be honest in your hearts, I don't want to show hands. I really don't. That, that phrase that I read a while ago that we understand, lex talionis, the law of retaliation. How many times in your life have you thought that very thing? I'd love to give them what's coming to them. I'd love to see it happen. I want to see it happen. You see, you actually almost salivate with the thoughts of seeing a person who's hurt you receive comeuppances, as they say. They deserve it. Whatever they get, they deserve it. Well, remember one thought. This is the one that just stirs my pot. We all deserve something. We talk about the grace and the mercy of God. Grace is He doesn't give us what we do deserve. Mercy is He gives us what we don't deserve. Because of who and what we are, we deserve hell, death, and the grave because we were born natural born sinners. But because of the grace and mercy of God, you don't get what you deserve. He gives you what you don't deserve. He gives you his grace and his mercy. He gives you his kingdom at full disposal to use for his glory, yes, but so that you can be a servant that receives the rewards of your Father in heaven. You do not get to make the call they deserve. If it's in a legal matter, the court system's here will handle it. But when it comes to you and how the people interact with you as a servant of the king, all you are to do is let God be God and the Spirit of God move in that situation and watch what he does. You pray for people, period. I told Desiree, I listened to the story again of a gentleman, sadly enough, it must be age catching up with me. His name just left my mind completely. He was one of the greatest missionaries in the 1800s that ever lived. Built a lot of orphanages. Does that rattle anybody's remembrance? Oh, well. I can't think of his name. Miller! Bingo! Who said that? Okay, we owe you money. <laughs> Mueller was 30 years old when he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Changed his life radically. Um, I mean, his whole life is nothing short of miraculous for the way that he would pray and the way that God would answer this man. The Lord told him that he was going to go into ministry, but he couldn't afford it. He asked his father. His father said no, because up to that time, he had lived as a hypocrite, serving in the church, per se, doing the work of God, but all under the pretenses, it was, it was a steady paycheck. That's all he did it for. But when he radically got set free and delivered and at 30 years of age, God said, I am going to use you, and you're going to serve me as a minister. And he couldn't afford to go to school, and he prayed for it and prayed for it, and God said, I want you to go in there, and I want you to register. It'll be covered. So he went to the school. He went in, he was signing the paper, signing up, enrolling himself for classes. While he was standing in line, somebody walked up and handed him money, stuck it in his pocket. He didn't even look at it. He walked up to the counter and they asked him how he was going to pay for it. Reached in his pocket, took out to the penny. It was exactly what he needed to enroll for college. God had told him, I'll pay for it. Don't you worry about it. You just show up and sign up for the classes. The rest of his life was lived that way. They wouldn't use him. In the ministry, because they found out his prior life and how he'd been a mockery of serving the Lord for the wrong reasons. They said, it's an outcast, we can't use you. He graduated from college. He, by praying to the Lord, the Lord, after a year of praying, said, now I'm going to send you. Go to this other nation. He went. He gets there. He goes to the first church that he comes to that God told him to go to. He walks in. He goes, my name's so-and-so. I'd like to speak to your pastor. So we just lost our pastor. He just quit. He said, oh, well, I just graduated ministry school. You're hired because he was following the commands of God. He built more orphanages because he was listening to God than anybody. Anybody. He raised over $7 million in the 1800s. That's unheard of. Because he listened to God. He prayed fervently. And when he was 93 years old, when he was dying, his caretaker heard him every morning praying, every morning praying, praying this one name, kept coming out this one name over and over and over again. And he asked him, Mr. Mueller says, why do you pray for this one person every day? He said, I was best friends with this guy. At 30 years of age, when I came to know Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, he rejected me and he rejected the truth of who Jesus was and would have nothing to do with me. 
I've prayed for him for 63 years. Every day I pray that this man will come to know Jesus the Christ, even though he has nothing to do with me, talks bad about me. George Mueller died. At his funeral, the servant was there. Saw a man walk up to the coffin of George Mueller, drop to his knees sobbing, and ask Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of his life. It was that man. It's what we're called to do. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. The question's simple. No long drawn out anything. I'm going to ask you point blank if you're holding anything today. Anything against anyone. I asked you this last week about anger, un unforgiveness, whatever, resentment. Or if there's somebody right now in your heart that when their name, when their face pops in your mind, the first thing you do is grit your teeth and hope to God that you don't see them because you'd like to sock them in the face. I'm telling you right now, you need to get that out. Repent of it. Turn away from it. Give it to God and don't you ever go back to it again. It is like sucking down vile poison from the enemy into your soul. It will kill you. The Christ himself said, I forbid it and you shouldn't want it. The good news is, if you give it to the Christ and you walk away from it and you make right between you and that person, watch what happens. Watch what God will do in the midst of that situation, not only with your life, but their life as well. So that's what I ask of you right now. Nothing big, nothing fancy. Will, would you come up here, please, sir? I've asked this young man if he'd close us out, whatever the Lord puts on his heart to lead us in prayer about. I love you. I want the best for you. Because God loves you and wants the best for you. Amen.